listening to Raw, 12.51 a.m. Bringing you your favourite shows 24-7. You lot are locked in to Tux Tuesdays. You're listening to the Daisy and Amy show. This is living up the weekend at one o'clock. Hear the best new music. You and your love for Taylor Swift. I, oh, no, you don't. That's gone out on air now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Stay informed with Raw News Update. Certainly we're one of the few universities in the country who gets to sit on the University Senate. Some people have viewed this protest as a reaction to one person, which can seem like a bit of a witch hunt. What would you say to those people? Keep the score with our daily sports analysis. They have dug deep. They have equalised. Wearing six. Currently six. Discover the best on-campus talent. This is the show where we bring on creative writing, homegrown at work. Sitting on a bridge, looking at a broken edge, at the gap too far to jump and the drop too far below. And follow us as we go outside the studio. I'm Lauren and I'm sitting with the beautiful foxes. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. How are you? If you've been asleep, you have so missed out. You're listening to Raw, 12.51 a.m. This is your student radio station. Can I make something clear uh, to you? UKIP is not against immigration. We welcome immigration. We want immigration. Hello and welcome to Perspectives, our second show of the term. This is obviously the Politics Society's radio show, and we will be talking everything from politics, uh, including the junior doctor strike, Ken Livingston, and a range of other things. My panel today include Alistair Goldspink, who uh, was on the panel last week. You would have heard him. Sam Keeling, who was on the panel last week again. Uh, Matt Pierce, who is the president of Warwick Labour. Sam Berkson, who was also on the panel last week. And Jack Hadfield, who is a B knock around campus for all the wrong reason. Moving on now to the <laughs> topics we will be discussing today and uh, I only say that Jack because of the, the Banana Gate scandal on Raw that was that was aired on Raw News. Um, moving on now to the issues and firstly obviously on Thursday we will be voting or some of us will be at least for our next police and crime commissioner. I'm just going to go round and ask the panellists have you voted, have you registered to vote firstly and secondly if you have will have you decided who you'll be voting for? Alistair, have you registered to vote in this particular election? Uh, no. As a politics student? Uh, yeah, it's not good, is it? Um, <laughs> partly um, out of um, complete apathy, um, but partly out of the fact that I don't feel like I'm in particularly in favour of any of the parties standing for election. Really? In British politics currently, so, yeah. What do you think about the role as a, as a concept, having elected police and crime commissioners? Uh, yeah, I think obviously it's it's a concept that's been borrowed from America, uh, where apparently it works quite well in both rural and urban areas. Um, but yeah, I think it's, a, it's generally making anything more democratic is probably a good thing, so I am in favour of that. Okay, fair enough. Sam, have you, uh, this is our first Sam, have you voted, have you registered to vote? Rather, I'm registered to vote back home in Gloucestershire, Henry. But so you'll be voting for your Gloucestershire Police and Crime Commissioner. It depends whether or not I go home, to be honest with you, because like, um, like Alistair, I'm sort of quite indifferent to a lot of the um, the politics these days. I, I, I voted Conservative at the uh, election last May, but since then I've become rather disenfranchised with everything. Matt I'm looks upset that you voted Conservative. Uh, so, what, so you're disenfranchised. Do you agree with the role as a, as a concept? Yeah, I agree with the role as a, as a concept. Okay. I do again agree with Alistair that to um, to have it to have it uh, elected is a more democratic idea. But when um, when some of the the candidates aren't people you necessarily identify with, mm. the, the democratic sort of ban uh, benefits of it are rather undermined. I think just becomes a, a party ticket, doesn't it? Really. Uh, just to let you know, you can get involved in the conversation today by tweeting us at Perspectives Raw or tweeting the Warwick Politics Society at Warwick Polsock, or if you're listening online, click the contact tab on Raw. Moving on now to Matt. Matt, as the President of Warwick Labour, I assume you'll be voting for your Labour Police and Crime Commissioner candidate here in Warwickshire. Yes, I will. I'm registered at uh, both addresses, but no, I will be voting here. And, OK, oh, you, are you postal vote at the other address, or will you just not be not be voting? No, I'll just be voting here. OK, and have you... So, the Labour... Has there been much campaigning for the, for the Labour candidates? I mean, I know she, the, the candidate is Julie Jackson. She has been doing quite a lot it, around Warwickshire. Um... As we're at Labour, we've focused more on Coventry. Um, we've prioritised council elections because yes. there's a lot of close seats nearby. Um, but it's good to see them out there campaigning in Leamington and other places. That's another thing. The, the seats in Coventry are obviously key to uh, to Labour. How, how I mean, have the students Warwick Labour been out on the on the doorsteps? I know, yeah, I've no, seen a lot of events going out. Yeah, we've done uh, we've done quite a lot. Um, we'll be out there all day on Thursday. But just in the past few weeks, um, really good turnout. Actually, we got um, eight or nine people one day. Um, and then we did some phone canvassing as well. So, yeah, it's all going really well. Everyone seems really enthusiastic for it. Fantastic. And I'll ask you a lot of us, the others. Uh, do you agree with the role as a, as a concept? Um, I agree that police should be made more accountable. I don't necessarily think it's wise to make it party political. 
Okay. Um, but if it is going to be party political, then, you know, I would certainly vote for the Labour candidate. But, I mean, if the best... I, I, yeah, I mean, I just... Police must be made more accountable, but to make it an elected role uh, seems to politicise the issue when, you know, uh, law and order shouldn't really be about that. OK, and Sam, do you... Uh, have you made up your mind as to who you'll be voting for, or have you registered to vote at all? Yeah, um, I just want to firstly say I'm absolutely gobsmacked to be invited back after last <laughs> week. <laughs> Why would you? No, what do you mean? Uh, yeah, um, I'm registered for... Um, here and also back on the Wirral, but I'll be voting here and I'll be voting for the Labour candidate, whoever that may be. <laughs> you can put a pig with a red rosette on and still vote. But then that's the thing, do you think that is part of the problem and I'll open this, up to, open this up to everyone, do you think that's part of the problem that you are voting for a party political police and crime commissioner without knowing the candidate themselves? Do you see that as a problem? Uh, probably. But, um, <laughs> For me, it's more I want to have a good result for the Labour Party in, okay. the, in what is probably quite a marginal area so of the country. So you think if it is political, which it is, then you'd rather Labour representing you, obviously? I, I'm sure that. whoever gets elected will probably do a good job anyway, but um, mm. I agree with the account- accountability is good, especially with the recent um, Hillsborough verdict, if more accountability within the police is um, a good thing. But that, that's who I'll be voting for. OK. Yeah. And Jack, will you be voting for the Labour candidate at the uh, <laughs> Warwickshire Police and Crime Commissioner elections, or have you indeed registered to vote in the first place? Well, I mean, you know, shock news here. I'm not actually voting for the Labour candidate this time around. You know, I'm obviously a surprise to, to, to many people who know me. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I've registered to vote both here and at home. Um, I'll only be voting here, though, because I didn't um, get a postal vote. Um, if I were voting at home, I'd be voting for the Conservative candidate, but I think I'm going to go purple here. Here. Okay. Um, the only reason, yeah, because I, again, I'm disenfranchised with the Tories. Um, but I said, if I was voting at home, like uh, the Conservative candidate back in Nottingham, he's, he's an ex uh, policeman, and I think he would actually do a good job. So if I, I would be voting for him as a person. Rather That's interesting. Than, rather than along party lines. But here are you voting for the party because you don't necessarily know the candidates uh, yeah, no, as well. I, I haven't heard anything about the candidates, so here that I'm just sort of, you know, voting for the party, you know, against against the Tories. OK, well, coming up on the show later, we'll just go to a quick song. We have, obviously, the saga with Ken Livingstone. We will also be touching on the Junior Doctors on Ed Ball's Day, which I hope all of you celebrated in the correct fashion. And we'll also be talking about George Galloway, allegedly, on 40% in the polls. In a world where students had to save tirelessly to see good movies, there was just one award-winning society who could save the day. Blockbusters, classics, and independent films are outstanding value. And if you volunteer, you can see all of these for free, as well as having the opportunity to work in front of house or learn the art protection. To find out more, go to filmsock.warwick.ac.uk. I'm a Bollywood fan, so anything with a Bollywood theme, I'm looking, I will lap it up. You say you're a Bollywood fan. Do you have a favourite actor or a favourite Bollywood film? Oh, no, you're, you're going to... I wouldn't be able to... What do you think? No, I'm not going to give you one. I can't think of, I can't think of a favourite. Think of a single Bollywood film or actor. I, I, I can think of... I can't think of a favourite. I, I love the whole... I love almost everything about Bollywood. I love the atmosphere, I love the colour, I love the excitement. Zach Goldsmith there pretending he loves Bollywood <laughs> sound clapping. He obviously enjoyed that. We were talking about that briefly in the break. And was, well, before we go on to Ken, we'll just a few words on this. The, the campaign for London Mayor. So uh, how many people here live in London out of interest? Is it just me? So do you think do, do you think it affects you much? Have you taken much interest in the campaign? I'll start with you, Jack. Have you taken an interest in the campaign? And what have your perceptions from the outside been as to the, the, the sort of ongoings? Because obviously there's been a lot of uh, talk about Zach Goldsmith having it having a negative campaign, calling Sadiq Khan a, a, a radical, uh, and Sadiq Khan obviously uh, being criticised for flip-flopping allegedly on issues. What do you think about the, about the campaign in general? Yeah, well, I mean, I think Goldsmith's campaign has definitely been uh, really weak. Um, you know, again, I don't think he should have focused on uh, Sadiq as much as he did. You know, again, nobody really likes negative campaigning in that way. Uh, again, I think uh, we, we, uh, we, when we were talking about the breaks, when we mentioned that he should have done, you know, more, more a Boris style of campaigning and mm. training his nice guy, but it's, again, he said he doesn't have that same kind of instinct as Boris. Um, you know, he's just, he's a very... 
yeah, it's a very sort of typical career politician vibe that I get from him. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, opening that up to anyone else, uh, Matt, you'll obviously have something to say because you've been following the Labour campaign. What do you think about Zach Holdsworth's campaign in general? Yeah, I mean, just first of all, starting off with Sadiq Khan, calling him a radical was, uh, you know, a bit close to the line. But then the other day, uh, I think it was in the Mail, uh, he did a an article, and in the 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 title of the article was something calling Sadiq Khan the Labour Party terrorist sympathisers. Uh, but in the background, there was one of the buses that blew up from Seven Seven, and I mean that I actually that same picture has been used for BMP. Um, has it really? You know, um, leaflets. So I mean, it's. I actually, I thought Zach Goldsmith was um, quite a liberal person, but someone's got to be accountable for that campaign, mm. and it is him. And it's pretty disgusting. I think it will fail. He cannot shift the blame on yeah. that. We're going to move on now to Ken Livingston. <laughs> Obviously, this was in the news last week uh, quite a lot, and he's been suspended now from the Labour Party for anti-Semitic remarks and said his, his quote was that Hitler supported Zionism before he went mad and killed six million Jews. And he was talking about this in reference to Naz Shah, who was suspended from the Labour Party as well, and he said she was completely over the top and rude, but not, and I repeat, not anti-Semitic. Uh, Matt, have you got anything to say on the Ken Livingston saga? Do you think he was rightfully... Uh, I was going to say expelled then. Do you think he was rightfully suspended from the party? Yeah, absolutely. And um, obviously I wouldn't like to uh, kind of uh, conject, but it's, it's, cl it's clear what was said. And I think it's time for him to be expelled from the party. I mean, we can't tolerate this kind of stuff. I thought the only plus side that I did see out of it was the reaction within the Labour Party. It was quick to suspend him. Mm. A lot of Labour MPs went out and said this is not acceptable. Um, I don't think this is a Labour Party thing. I think... Over the past week, we've seen a lot of racial incidents, whether that be Jerry Adams, whether that be um, Boris Johnson. Uh, but no, it's disgusting. It has no place within the Labour Party or within society. OK. Uh, Alistair, Matt there says that the Labour Party doesn't have a problem with uh, the issue. But in the last few days, three Labour councillors have allegedly been suspended. Do you think the party does have an inherent problem <coughs> with this issue? And do you think Ken Livingstone uh, being suspended was a long time coming? It was going to happen inevitably? Uh, I think there's a couple of points I'd make about this one. Uh, first one, I find myself in the opposition of defending Ken Livingstone because <laughs> what he said... I, I don't see it as being specifically anti-Semitic. Now, I'm the first one to point out anti-Semitism, I think that's what the case is, but he, said, he, 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 he made a poor historical point, but I think that's about the worst you can accuse him of. I think the question you have to ask is, why was it appropriate to bring up Hitler in a discussion about anti-Semitism right. within the political party in Great Britain in 2016? Second point I make, though, yes, I think the Labour Party has a problem with anti-Semitism. I don't think it was there before. I think a lot of it... Uh, comes from elements of the party uh, that have perhaps, uh, or rather elements that have attached themselves to the party since, uh, you know, the leadership election in 2015. Uh, certainly the far left has a huge problem with anti-Semitism, and that seems to be creeping into mainstream left-wing politics. OK, and now moving, uh, we're sort of looking at that issue more broadly, I'll open this up to the, to the panel. Uh, Corbyn doesn't think this will lose him any council seats or affect Sadiq Khan's campaign. Obviously, Sadiq, we were discussing earlier, has been doing really well in the mayoral election. You know, uh, polls put him over six points ahead of Zach Goldsmith. Do you think this could affect, at the last minute, his campaign? I'll go to Sam first. Yeah, um, I would like to echo the point that there is a problem on the hard left of the Labour Party with uh, anti-Semitism. I do disagree with Matt on that because this anti-Western, anti-American imperialism, as they call it, um, is, is a problem in that wing of the party. Um, but, um, sorry, um, um, That's right. where was I? You uh, yeah, yeah, Ken Livingston has just been extremely counterproductive um, because the Naz Shah incident in isolation is a story and it's a story for probably a day. He mm. did not have to go out and defend her and cause the media storm that has brought himself, um, the leaders, and the, the rest of the party down in the run-up to what are very important elections. Mm. Jack, do you think that Ken Livingstone has blown Labour's chance of winning council seats or Sadiq, or Sadiq Khan finishing with a big margin over Zach Goldsmith, or do you think it won't affect the campaign at all? 
I think, yeah, I think there might be a few people who have been turned off by this, but certainly not really enough to have um, a, a significant impact on the campaign overall. Um, one thing I would just say, again, which is a uh, Again, old coming for me. In, in defence of Corbyn, um, you know, a lot of these councillors who have come out, you know, were, you know, there in, around the time of Miliband and before. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, this came from you know Brent, Brendan O'Neill, who writes for Spike. You know, he pointed out that um, Corbyn and his party have been very quick to expel those who've been accused of um, anti-Semitism, just exactly um, the same as uh, as UKIP have been quick to um, expel, you know, um, uh, racists on, on, hard, on the hard right of their party too. Um, I think, yeah, a lot, obviously I, I do think Corbyn, um, he, he's pretty, you know, he's very pro-Palestine and I wouldn't really trust him in terms of negotiations with Israel, but I, I think we all have to give him credit uh, and top wing the Labour Party for quickly rooting out the genuine anti-Semites that we have seen. Sam, have you got a, a point to make on the general issue of uh, the of Ken Livingstone, effectively? Well, yeah, I've got a couple of points to make. I would definitely um, agree with uh, Alistair in that the left does have a problem with anti-Semitism. But the problem with this particular issue is it's, in many cases, self-inflicted completely. Ken Livingstone did not have to mention Hitler. He could have defended um, Nashville without evoking Hitler. And so the ensuing problem is entirely self-inflicted. The same with all the the, the, um, the Labour councillor who um, tweeted a couple of weeks ago that Hitler was the greatest man in history. She didn't have to do that. It's an entirely voluntary action. And she was a student at Warwick, yeah. I believe. Yeah. God. It's rather, that's rather depressing, isn't it? It is rather. Now, moving on ever so slightly, it, it, it's on a similar issue, but I'd just like to play you a little bit of John Mann speaking to Ken Livingstone. <laughs> Disgusting Bye-bye. racist. Bye-bye. Rewriting Bye-bye. history, Bye-bye. you're a disgusting Bye-bye. racist. You're saying it's not true. You're yes, a, you're a lying racist. Really? Why don't you go and check A Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. You're a disgusting Nazi apologist, Livingstone. Rewriting history. Go back and check what Hitler did. Go back and check what Hitler did. There's a book called Mein Kampf. You've obviously never heard of it, written in 1925. Yes, you've never read it. You know know nothing about it. You know nothing about what Hitler did in 1932. Dachau concentration camp in his first 50 days. The race purity laws in his first 100 days. And you dare say, you dare say that Hitler supported Zionism. You're up, you've, you've lost it, mate. You need help. Go you back need to help. Boy saying, you need help. Yeah, you you got, need help. Factually wrong. No, factually wrong. Actually, uh, Racist uh, remarks. Go and check your history. That's check my history. That was the policy they ran on. That was John Mann there talking to Ken Livingstone. I mean... Uh, uh, as much as what Ken Livingstone did was regarded as unacceptable, obviously now he's been suspended from the party. Matt, do you think there's a place for John Mann to talk to someone, a party member, and obviously a, a fairly respected mayor, former mayor of London? Do you think, I know John Mann was called to the Whip's office after that, do you think John Mann should be cautioned for speaking to the party? I mean, surely that's bringing the party into, disre- into disrepute. Yeah, I think it's very important that it is the party that disciplines Ken Livingston and not individual MPs. Um, I'd say, I mean, I I certainly like to uh, see him cautioned, um, just because uh, it's very counterproductive to do that. It's it's better to wait for the Labour Party to uh, conduct a swift investigation. Um, But no, it's understandable why he would say those things, because what Ken Livingston said was absolutely... Apparently, like, yeah. it, it's not. It's not a good front, though, is it, for the for the national media to have no, to have it's, a, a, it's, a Blairite, a Labour MP criticising Livingston because it makes it look like a, an ideological issue when really it's an anti-Semitism issue. Right. Um, so okay. I, I, I don't think I don't. Th- I think it's really counterproductive, and you should have waited for the party to act. But again, I can see why you would do that. Uh, Alistair, do you think John Mann was wrong to do that? Because obviously the Labour Party aren't the only ones who've had their problems with racist remarks. The Liberal Democrats, the Conservative Party and UKIP have all had their issues with various councillors saying what not. Do you think this issue is so important because Livingston was the mayor? And do you think John Mann should be cautioned? Do you think there's any place for him in a party like that? Uh, John Mann has been a bit of a silly boy. <laughs> he's, he's obviously done it for a reason. He knows it's in public. He knows there's media watching. It's just before a televised live broadcast, and he's taken that conscious decision to embarrass his party. Now, being a Blairite, he's going to be a rebel, obviously, against the current leadership. Um, However, I have this on relatively good information. 
Corbyn and the senior guys at the top of the party uh, wanted man suspended as well, and it was only an intervention by the Labour chief whip that actually saved him. Mm. So clearly there was going to be an equal degree of punishment meted out to, to man for embarrassing the party. Mm. Um, do I disagree with what, with what he said and the level of anger he had? Uh, not really, no. OK. Well, obviously, we don't. That, that's a very interesting point, Alistair, and that's something to ponder on, but just like to point out at Raw, we don't know that information specifically. But thanks for bringing that up. That's, that's very interesting, if that is the case. Sam, what would you like to say on the issue? Yeah, I would just like to say um, I, John Mann is a Jewish member of Parliament, and I, I was at um, a wedding on Sunday, and half the people there were Jewish members of my family, and I spoke to some of them who have... Um, rescinded their membership since Ken Livingston's comments because they regard his comments as deeply offensive um, to, to Jewish people and this is what I think the underlying problem is is that there's a, a problem of definitions of um, distinguishing between criticising Israeli policy um, being anti-Zionist and being anti-Semitic and as a harsh critic of Israeli policy myself I would never deny Israel's right of existence and I, I think as soon as you slide from talking about um, people being killed, Palestinians being killed by Israeli policy if that slides into Israel shouldn't be there okay. um, I think that's at the what point you say this is anti-Semitic because if you deny the Jewish people of their homeland that is as good as um, saying uh, I hate Jewish people for me okay now we've had a few messages in from a couple of people firstly Simon has messaged in about can we speak about the EU and he's, he's uh, named a few things uh, why the EU is sp specific to him and why he thinks we should discuss it and I'll tell Simon that we will be discussing it at a later date in a couple of weeks time because we're, we, we've already pre-done the show uh, in terms of what we're talking about but we will talk about the EU for you sir at a later date and another message in which I assume is uh, to, uh, aimed towards Matt says hi could, just wondering whether you think the Labour Party should allow Ken back in at all after he served his suspension or do you think he should be banned completely he's damaged the party's reputation a lot no um, as I said he should be expelled in my opinion okay very clear answer there from Matt I'm George Galloway and you're listening to Raw <laughs> it's Raw and it's fantastic where the pottery is community I wish the shadow chance would occasionally shut up and listen to the answer <laughs> I may be alone in finding him the most annoying person in modern politics. David Cameron there talking about Ed Balls, who we will be touching on later after the host, after the historic, the historic touching Ed on Balls. Balls Day. Touch it. We will be okay. touching oh, on uh, Ed uh, Balls. <laughs> now, nice. moving on now to the junior doctors scandal, I'd like to call it, and I'll quickly play you a little bit of a clip from Dennis Skinner. Dennis Skinner. Yeah. Uh, when the uh, Secretary of State came into the chamber today. I don't know whether he realises it or not, but there's a smirk and arrogance about him that almost betrays the fact that he's delighted in taking part in this activity. He could start negotiations today, wipe that smirk off his yeah. face, get down to some serious negotiations. It's had to be done in the past, but instead he comes into here to try and blame the opposition for what's taking place. This strike can only be caused by two sides. One of the junior hospital doctors and the other side is the government is almost giving the impression that he's reveling in standing up to the junior hospital doctors. Start negotiating now and sort the matter out. Who are you? I'd never heard of you. Nobody in Europe had ever heard of you. Just in case you haven't heard, this was obviously about the strike, the junior doctor strike, the other week. I know there was a lot of protests in London regarding the strike. Alistair, we spoke about it briefly last week. Do you think the strike was successful? Do you think it's, uh, and obviously successful in what, I don't know what you define success, but as in, do you think it will change Jeremy Hunt's mind, or do you think it was effective? Um, well, the <laughs> I, I'd say uh, it's, it, the strike... <sighs> has been as effective as you might hope it to be. It's got a lot of public attention. There's a lot of people now thinking about it. It's probably reduced support for the government by a certain percent. Um, 
But in reality, the government holds all the cards. They've got, they've, they've got the money. I mean, ultimately, unless the doctors are going to resign en masse, which is not something I can see happening, except in the most extreme circumstances, um, it's, it's not going to change anything. The government will just implement the contract anyway, and, and that'll be, you know, the matter dealt with, as far as I can tell. OK, Jack, do you think the strike was effective in any way, or do you think, subsequently, do you think it would change Jeremy Hunt's mind? Um, no, I, th- I think the only thing was the way strike was effective was just in you know stopping people from actually getting the treatment they need, the operations you know they needed, and it's really disrupting the NHS. But you say that, Jack. Do you so? Do, do you agree with the right of junior doctors to strike in the first place, or would you put a ban on it? I don't think I'll put a ban on them striking. I think that's going a little bit too you far. You just wouldn't allow them to. <laughs> no, I, I just think I, I, I think their whole case is a little bit selfish. Um, now this again, where you know what this opinion is coming from is um, it's a family friend of mine. It's worked in the NHS for many years. Okay. Very labour again, very pro NHS. Certainly the last person you'd be thinking to criticise NHS. And she was saying is that the junior doctors, you know, they get you know, at like a hundred thousand pounds, I believe, in a few years after they've gone through, you know, their training in the first years on the course. And you know, she's with as. As, as within the NHS, you know, she's um, not exactly yeah, a fan of them. I've got to say, you know, I would probably trust her views on the NHS, you know, a lot than other people. So you, effecti- so you effectively think that the junior doctors are participating in... This is intolerable behaviour. No, it's not funny. Uh, Matt, I assume you have a slightly different opinion to Jack on the issue. Yeah, it's... Um... <sighs> It certainly shows how alienated these junior doctors feel. I feel the same arguments going against how they, you know, don't have a right to strike or they shouldn't strike are often ones that, you know, don't want, um, don't want immigration either. They want to leave the EU. So it's like, where do you think we're going to get these doctors from? Like, you know, that the the NHS relies on immigration, and then, you know, when the when there's actually something wrong, you know, when when. Well, when, when when Jeremy Hunt says um, we influence this contract, you know, public opinion is against them. What is wrong with them going out and striking? They should be heard. Jack, what do you think to that? Well, I, I'm in fact in, in favour of training a lot lot more of our doctors here. Um, I Just think not giving Jeremy, them any money. No, I, I, I think <laughs> I think the def- there's definitely Jeremy Hunt has messed up a lot on the NHS. Um, do you know but, why he's messed up? Bad human decisions. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Bernie Sanders, though. <laughs> but yeah, um, I think um, again, you know, uh, t- taking a lot of doctors from overseas and not supporting some of the training. I think cutting cutting training funding. He's he's, he's definitely gone over there. Um, so I, I I I'm I'm not really on the side of Hunt in this case either. So whose side are you on? Well, no, I, I think I'm taking a stand on sort of triangulation. On, like a no, so, I'm not saying so, I'm saying on each so Jack, specific you, bit of the NHS. Have you looked at the demands of the contract in comparison to what the government are proposing? Because I think if you actually look, what it's not an outrageous difference that the junior doctors want. It's something that is going to suit them more. Sam, do you? What do you think about this issue? Um, I think Jeremy Hunt should resign. I, he, wa- he walks around with the pin badge with the I NHS agree. on, even though he co-wrote a book on how to dismantle it. Um, he has made no effort to um, give the junior doctors anything of what they want, and these are the people who are the future of our National Health Service. And if you impose this contract, we already have a problem of not enough people training to work in the medical profession or wanting to work abroad, um, and this will further perpetuate that problem. I spoke a lot about this last week, so I'm not going to say any more than that. That's right. And uh, Sam, what do you think about the Um, junior doctors issue? In answer to your original question, which was whether or not it's been a success, I dare say it hasn't been a success, but I don't think that's entirely the fault of the junior doctors, because obviously around the time it was happening, we had a lot of media coverage, a lot of traction. But I think regarding the, um, the recent issue surrounding Ken Livingstone, is that Goldsmith and the other um, political stories that have unfolded since then, any um, attention that might have been gathered by the by the campaign after the strikes themselves, I think, has been stolen by Ken Livingstone and his controversy. So I think it's a shame that um, cock-ups on the part of the Labour Party have detracted from the junior doctor's cause. We'll end that particular conversation uh, with a quote from you, Matt. What would, if you were living in London, do you think you would have gone on that strike and, and stood with the junior doctors? Yes, you would. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And, and the Labour Party's fully behind the junior doctors? 
Yeah, and I, just one quick point. It just annoys me how, like you said, Jeremy Hunt should resign. Like, and we saw this with Michael Gove, and we'll see it with Nicky Morgan as well. When is the Prime Minister and when is the actual whole uh, cabinet going to take some responsibility instead of making these individual ministers scapegoats? And there uh, mm. is another case, and Nicky Morgan with the false academisation, yes. it's another case of a top-down restructure of, um, from a Secretary of State with no experience in that field, ignoring the advice of people who spent many years it, working in that field and know probably what's going to be best for it in the future. She was booed off the stage, I believe, when she spoke to a load of head teachers. We're going to move on now to Ed Ball's day, which I'm sure you are all very much, uh, you all very much enjoy. What's the difference and, between you and David Cameron? Well, I'm Mayor of London, he's Prime Minister. And I, well, I'm, I'm older terms. than him, I'm older and I'm considerably heavier. Um, what else? I beat him at tennis. And we not only saved the world, uh, saved the banks and saved, <laughs> saved, saved the banks and led the way. Sam, how did you celebrate Ed Ball's Day? Sam Keeling. <laughs> celebrate? Well, you didn't celebrate Ed Ball's Day. Bizarrely enough, no, I didn't. <laughs> do you do you know what the origins of Ed Ball's Day are? Do you yeah. know how the how the tweet the yes. infamous tweet came yeah, about? Yeah, I do. I do know how it came about. Back in 2011, um, Ed Balls, who was then um, a man who who held some uh, some sort of authority, he was at least an MP <laughs> then. Um, he was advised by one of his aides to go on Twitter to find out ha what the public thought of him. Obviously, on Twitter, you can if you're famous, you can you can search your name and see um, whether you're trending or not, and what the what the general consensus is on you as a person. However, Ed Balls, being perhaps new to Twitter. Accidentally tweeted his own name rather than searching his own name, so you just got this uh, this two word tweet, Ed Balls, and uh, yeah, and it's that, gone viral ever since. He never looked back, did no. he, Ed? Alistair, did you celebrate Ed Balls Day this year? Um, yeah, I had a simple celebration. Um, I retweeted uh, the cake, <laughs> um, and, and I made a, a, um, a, a small muffin in, in, uh, in, in additional celebration. I felt that was that was the amount of celebration. Well, it Ed sounded like you had June. quite a sombre Red Bulls day then, <laughs> really. Well, it's it's the first you know it's the first anniversary, I guess, of, of, of the end of his political career, and you do feel a certain melancholic sadness about that. Yeah, I do. Yeah, you got to love Ed. No. Yeah. yeah. No. No. no I, I like Ed the person. I like Ed the person. That's fine. Matt, are you a fan of Ed the person? And how did you celebrate Ed Balls Day? Just classic going onto Twitter, but you know, it's always been a really joyous occasion. You know, like Christmas or Easter, like. Um, but. After what happened in the general election, just it's just sad, isn't it? It's sad. It's devastating, really, isn't it? It just makes the day go longer. <laughs> And uh, Sal, Sam Keeley's got something. Yeah, to say. just just one more thing. This is quite a um, quite a, pet, a catty thing to say, but I suppose now that he now that he's lost his seat, he's got nothing better to do. So yeah, tweeting pictures of birthday cakes. Oh, oh. He's a, sorry, I'm sorry, no. he's a Harvard professor. Come he on. is. Oh, a, he's he's he? going on I do apologise. He's, he's, he's a Harvard city. professor. Yeah, he's he's, he's doing lectures at Harvard. Isn't yeah, he also the the chairman of Norwich or something? He's got loads of stuff going on. Chief exec. That's it. He'll be back. Sam, are you a fan of Ed Balls? Um, I think he. He's a pretty skilled uh, economist. Um, oh, who's okay. who smirk there? Sneakers from the right. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and, and George Osborne's history sense. degree. <laughs> um, no, um, mm. Ed Balls, he <laughs> makes a very good cake. Um, I saw him on Sport Relief Bake Off a few months ago. Did I think he's a totally nice man. Okay, he I really does have nothing when to do When Norwich City get relegated at the end of the season, it might be another job that he's losing. Yes, oh goodness, yeah. <gasps> That would be a, a horrible That'd year. Be a nail in the, the coffin. Poor old Ed. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, Jack, are you a fan of Ed Balls? And how did you celebrate Ed Balls Day? Well, I went back and retweeted the original tweet. As right, I hoped, as, I, as I hoped. Everybody I was expecting else everyone to go to sort of neon or smack and uh, and, and, <laughs> and dress up as Ed Balls. No, 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 I feel no, like. No. Uh, I don't know how anyone feels about this, but I feel that next year the Politics Society, of which you're on the, the Politics Radio Show now, should have an Ed Balls themed circle when it comes to Ed Balls Day. All in favour say aye. 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 Overwhelming response. No, in all seriousness, Jack, uh, final words about Ed Balls. Well, I just have a, a, a small tale from when he was younger because he uh, he went he went to my old school. Actually. Is it appropriate for the radio? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Um, he um, he. He transferred from Norwich uh, back into Nottingham. On his first day at school, he made a slight mistake because uh, it was show and tell day, and he bought in his Norwich City uh, shirt. Um, but at the time, Nottingham Forest and Norwich City were rivals, so he bought his Norwich City shirt his, uh, into a room full of Nottingham Forest fans who uh, who took a little bit of a dislike to him. 
Classic <laughs> Ed. <laughs> Absolute classic, classic Ed. We'll finish now on a message from Mark who says, I think John Mann was right in telling Ken Livingston, you have said, uh, in telling Ken Livingston, you've said about the police having to be accountable. I feel if I feel Ken Livingston needs to be, there is no place for people who think like him. And obviously Matt has said more than enough on his opinions on Ken Livingston. Thank you very much to the panel for being on the show. I hope you've all enjoyed it. We'll be back next week from three to four on Tuesday. Until then, you can tune in to a few more vaguely political shows. Unstructured Ramblings is on tomorrow from three to four on Raw. And on Friday morning from nine to ten, Sam, I assume you'll be on, it is Raw News. So I will leave you now with an interview with Amir Amirani, who was the director of the film We Are Many, which was a film about the Iraq War. And he was on campus as part of Protest and Performance Week. So until next week, I'll see you then. Uh, According to one headline, Jeremy Corbyn welcomed the prospect of an asteroid wiping out humanity. (laughs) Now, asteroids are pretty controversial. And it's not the kind of policy I'd want this party to adopt without a full debate in conference. So can we have the debate later in the week? Hello and welcome back to Raw 12.51 AM, your student radio station. And I'm delighted to be joined by Amir Amirani, who is the director and producer of uh, We Are Many, which is a film that was broadcasted for our protest and performance week at Warwick University. Firstly, uh, Amir, what sort of drove you to, you know, for you to be the one to make this film? Thank you. Um, what drove me to make the film was that I was in Berlin in 2003 uh, at the film festival to make a short film and I knew that the demonstration against the Iraq war was in the air and uh, there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to go on it and the question for me was whether I would go in Berlin or in London where I live and I decided to stay in Berlin and it looking back on it now I realize it was my first demonstration though not my first political act and when I got back to London and I was told how big it was you know two million in in London I felt I'd missed out on something quite important and that got me thinking uh, that if it was so big in London and it was huge in Berlin with half a million um, where else did it happen and then I started to look into it and realize it was global, realize that it was probably the biggest protest in history. And that's when I thought that this was a potentially really interesting story to tell of a historic moment, which most people at the time thought was a failure, a failure to stop the Iraq war. And even uh, a story that might be regarded as a failure can still be a compelling story. So that was really the genesis of the story for me and how I decided to make the film. So you've got your political views and your sort of strong inkling to want to make this film. Then comes the practical problems. I mean, you know, the film budget was for a documentary, you know, it was it was a, a reasonable amount. But, you know, how did you sort of afford to, to, you know, where did you start? How did you think you were going to afford to make this film? Well, it's a good question. Previously, I had made documentaries for the BBC and, and Channel 4 Live largely the BBC, they were fully commissioned, I produced and directed them with a budget provided. This time I had to find the budget, I didn't know what it was going to cost, I didn't know where the money was going to come from. I tried the BBC and Channel 4 to get them interested at the beginning, they were not interested. I um, ended up in 2011 launching a Kickstarter campaign, crowdfunding campaign. I should say, though, that I had actually begun work on the film in 2006. Between 2006 and 2011, I was researching and developing the story, really digging into it to find out all the characters and how the story of the demonstration evolved. Um, During that period, I had very little income and I uh, had to remortgage my flat in London three times just to uh, be able to pay my bills. But in 2011, I did a Kickstarter campaign. We were successful. We raised $92,000. And in 2012, um, I began work with that amount. And over the last five years, I raised roughly £600,000 to to make the film. Um, I... But the real cost of the film is probably well over a million because I did many, many deals. Um, 
uh, to cut our costs, but you can only cut your costs to a certain extent. So the hard costs are about 600,000 and probably the real costs are, as I said, well over a, um, a million. So. I ended up filming in seven countries around the world, interviewed over 100 people. We had about 200 hours of interview footage and had about 200 hours of archive footage as well that I had to whittle down uh, to um, 110 minutes. Um, so it took a long time. Uh, I think it was nine years in the making. Um, but some stories, you know, some films, do take that amount of time and, and and actually are the better for it I think yeah I was just going to say editing a film like that and sort of obviously you know in total it's about 10 years really worth of footage and then that long day that it was obviously historical editing that must have been actually a really difficult process for you you know thinking what's going to go in and what's you know not going to go in yes it took a lot of time to actually as i say it took about four or five years to sort of work out the arc of the story but then when you start to make the film you shoot and then you get into the editing uh into the cutting room then you have to craft the 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 film all over again uh with what you have and i think on and off we edited for about two years um i mean you know a bit of start stop with funding and so on but I would say it was about two years. And, you know, you have to sort of, um, you know, grapple with the material, you know, read all the interviews. And, um, uh, and, and in the end, you're, kind of, you're polishing and polishing and polishing until you have a sort of uh, a story that, that works, that, that, that flows. You mentioned there about having about 100 hours of interview footage. How difficult was it acquiring those interviews? So I know you couldn't get the full cabinet to uh, participate in an interview in Tony Blair. So how difficult was it and how, who did you, you know, sort of think to approach and whatnot in regards to interviewing? Uh, the main criteria I had that was that everyone had to have something to do with that demonstration. They either had to have been on it as a member of the public or as an artist, as an activist, you know, an organizer, or indeed as a politician to have had to have been in a position where they had to act upon their thoughts and feelings about the demonstration. So the demonstration of, of that day, 15th of February 2003, was the connecting detail. Um, and so that, that then made it easy. So on the one hand, it was the activists, and then I wanted to find other people from a broad spectrum of, you know, sort of artists and others who and other commentators or journalists and so on who had something to say about that demonstration the majority of people once i reached them were uh keen to be interviewed uh the politicians as you said tony blair's cabinet largely didn't i think i got two people talk uh, tony blair of course didn't talk but on the whole people had never really been asked about that demonstration um and i think they were keen to talk so you know the broadcasters the mainstream media newspapers and so on hadn't really seen that day as uh, significant uh, but for me that was really a, a big story and so when you some people were hard to reach because they had gatekeepers but once you got to them once i got to them they wanted to to talk and in terms of sort of other projects that are out there that perhaps aren't as high profile, uh, how did you did you find uh, yourself liaising with anyone? So I know George Galloway has a controversial film out about Tony Blair as well. And I was wondering, did you sort of feel that you were overlapping with other projects or did you sort of merge with other projects or did you want to keep a distance? Um, there were no other projects about the demonstration. There was a small one that was made that wasn't really, for me, a significant... Um, uh, it was sort of just about the UK, about the London protest, and, and I know the people, and that was really not a um, competition. There was no other film of this scale about the demonstration. Uh, I, I had worried about it, but in the end, my worries were unfounded. Um, I became aware of the George Galloway film about Tony Blair, I think that's the one you're talking about. Um, a few years ago, they came to me um, and asked my advice. Um, but again, that was um, that was not a direct um, competition or threat to uh, 
um, to my film and you know I gave them what little advice I could uh, but you know it's a totally different sort of subject in a way um, to, to the subject of my film about that particular day um, so there there were there was really on the whole no no issue um, about overlapping with anything else and just sort of final few thoughts um, firstly on the Chilcot inquiry you had a question about this uh, in the screening do you think do you hold much hope for what that will entail and do you think it's been delayed for so long now and you spoke about maximization I think it's called do you think it will be delayed even further and do you think it will even be of any sort of substance or even relevance to the cause they say that the Chilcot report is going to be published in June or July um, having been uh, is it five or six years now um, or maybe seven years I don't hold out much hope I am it from the beginning it's had no um, teeth it's had no lawyers on it it is its findings are not and will not be binding um, and if it does come out in June or July I think it will be largely a whitewash it's been discredited now I may be being hard on it but they haven't done themselves any favors by the um, by the delays I think that Tony Blair's um, apparent apology that he made last year was actually in response, in my view, to having seen the contents of the Chilcot inquiry with regard to himself. And I think that's an indication of really the extent of what is going to be said about him, which is not a great deal. Um, so I think we're going to be, I don't think anyone should be holding their, their breath. Chilcott at the very beginning said this is going to be a lessons learned inquiry and he gave most of the people a very very easy ride the whole panel gave them a very easy ride so unless he's really changed tack um, I doubt it I doubt very much that they're going to have anything um, really uh, interesting and significant to say. And just finally, what did that day do to politics in your eyes? So obviously, when you watch the film, uh, Jeremy Corbyn features a lot in it, and obviously he's now the leader of the Labour Party with it, within a serious shot of becoming Prime Minister. And you spoke about Bernie Sanders in the US. Do you think that day really did alter sort of the core of politics? You know, we're only, um, what is it, 13 years on from that demonstrations, and arguably it's a bit too soon to, to say. When I started to make the film in 2006, at that point, people said to me, you're too late. Um, only three years after the demonstration. Um, and we released it, uh, well, um, last last year. And um, we're still living with the consequences. Um, we're seeing the consequences of the demonstration and of the war. I think the result of that demonstration can be seen in two significant ways. One is that a lot of young people, a lot of first timers came on the demonstration and got their first taste of politics and became politicized and perhaps, you know, radicalized in some way. Um, a lot of people lost their faith in the political system on that day, uh, maybe an older generation. Um, and uh, the sort of scales fell from their eyes. Um, people who had had a real faith in politics and in democracy and the idea that people's voices mattered, their voices mattered that a demonstration on that scale would mean something, um, lost their faith. And, and on the other hand, some other people uh, were more um, sanguine about it and thought, well, okay, we sort of knew this, now it's been demonstrated, we must find and think about other ways to make our voices heard. One of those was David Babs, who went on to found 38 Degrees, the online petitioning um, uh, platform. Um, and other people went on to get involved in direct action and other kinds of you know, protests. So it was a significant moment. And I suspect we will probably much further down the line, look back and draw even um, you know, more interesting conclusions about that demonstration. But I really think it was a, a real turning point, not just for British politics, but for international politics, because people saw in a very clear, unambiguous way that despite huge historic opposition to a war, the decision to go to war, as we now know, was taken in advance of that in an incredibly undemocratic way. And that's a lesson that's not easily forgotten. Thank you so much for joining us.